Have you ever wondered, what is God's will in my life? What exactly does that look like? What exactly does that mean? That is a question that I have been wrestling with and, and, and struggling with for the last couple of weeks. And it's, it's frustrating because there, there, there's these moments where I think that I know, right? Like big picture, I know what God wants for my life. Uh, treat others the way that I would want to be treated. Love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. But, 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 the, but the details, I, I struggle with the details. I feel kind of lost and, and alone with it. Like I, I look at all these examples that we have in Scripture of times when people who would seek God's will, they had what, what seems to me advantages that we don't have, right? They could go to prophets, and they could ask them specifically, what is God telling you that we should do? They might not like the answer, but they, they, they could go. They could, they could get that upfront answer. They could, in some cases, speak directly to him, hear his voice directly. And, and it just seems like that kind of personal interaction is missing in, in my life. So I really wrestle, like, it, what, is, what does God want? I, I, I wish that he would, you know, part the clouds and speak directly to me, or at least send a guy to tell me, look, I'm here to let you know this is exactly what God is expecting. This is exactly what he wants you to do. But it's, it's just, it just seems like silence on the other end. It, it reminds me of my favorite video game when I was a little kid, uh, the, the, the Legend of Zelda. I don't know if any of you guys have played, played Zelda. I love, I love. And I, and I love, I love The Legend of Zelda because it was unlike anything that I had, you know, played up to that point in my life. It was, it was non-linear. Like most of the games, you know, Mario, stuff like that, everything kind of scrolled to the side. You were led where you needed to go. It was pretty evident and apparent what you needed to do. With Zelda, you had a vague idea, right? A, a princess had been kidnapped and taken to a far off castle and, and you needed to, to, to go rescue her. But it begins with you just dropped in a field, no explanation, no map, no tutorial, no nothing. And it's like, good luck, everybody, figure it out. As you just kind of wander around with no real discernible clue of what works, what doesn't, what's right, what's wrong, you just sort of wander. But even in the video game, right, there's a little bit of of direction, there's a little bit of of help. Um, One of the first little caves you wander into when you start you go in and there's an old man who comes out and he kind of lets you know what to expect. He says, it is dangerous to go alone. Take this. And he hands you a, a sword, right? And so you might not know what's ahead, but you know it's, it's not safe and you know I'm going to need protection. I might need to get serious with some baddies as they come at me. And so you, you kind of have an idea of what to expect. It gives you some kind of guidance. But with, with, with this question of, of where I am, right now, and, and what does God want in my life? I, I don't even feel like I have that old man. I just feel like it's me in a room. Sometimes my prayer is just hitting the ceiling. So I've really been wrestling with this, and I, as I looked in Scripture, I was really praying, like, all right, Lord, show me, how can I know my will in your life? And he, he guided me to, to the verse that we, we just heard read in First Thessalonians, and so I'd ask you to turn there with me. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 17. I just want to look at what Scripture says about how we can know exactly what it looks like to know God's will in our life. It says, let me see, make sure I got the right one. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. First pass, it seems very simple, right? Three bullet points, boom, boom, boom. Follow the formula, you will know God's will. But that's the surface, right? If you dig a little deeper, it doesn't quite seem that easy. So let's look at these in order. The first thing, always rejoice. Now that's easy to do when things are going well, right? When you've just been told you got a raise, rejoice, not a struggle. When you just found out you're, you're approved for, for the new bank loan or for, for your, your, your new house, not a problem to be like, thank you, Lord, that's, that's really good news. When you've been told that it's, it's benign, you don't have to worry about it. Like it's, it's, it's good, it's easy to struggle, but on the flip side of things, when things go bad, how do you rejoice? When you've worked for 30 years and poured everything, heart and soul, 
into a job that is supposed to provide for your family, provide for your future, and that is suddenly taken away. Are we supposed to go to God and say, thank you, Lord, for this hardship? When the person you love more than anything breathes their last breath, do we say, thank you, Lord? I, I, I rejoice at the loss that I'm wrestling with right now? How are we supposed to rejoice in the face of terror and calamity and uncertainty? When we look at the world around us, that's the world that we live in, right? Everywhere we look, there's some kind of struggle that seems to be superseding whatever little good thing, crowding out the good things in our life. How do we rejoice in situations like that? And I was, I was wrestling with that this week. And, 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 and as I started to think about it, I started to think about all the times in my past where I had wrestled with this question, where I had wrestled with God being there, where I had wrestled with the idea of what it really means to truly be joyful and rejoice. And in, in each instance, um, as I started to think about these things, I, I could see specific moments in my mind. And at first, it was kind of depressing, in all honesty. I, I, I can remember the day my grandmother died, the first time I really experienced loss in my life. I can remember where I was. I can remember just that idea of things are completely different. I can remember my brother's accident. I can remember these, these vivid pictures, these moments in time where it felt like the weight of the world was just pressing down on my chest. And in those instances, when I looked at those moments, my initial gut instinct, my gut reaction was not one of rejoicing. I'll be honest with you. Because I looked at that moment, I looked at those circumstances, and it was, it's, it's bleak if I'm focusing on what's happening. But then I started to think about it, and I, and, I, and I thought about where God was in those moments. And I saw, I saw his presence. Like, when I lost my grandmother, yeah, it was hard, but I also saw people come together to celebrate the life of a woman who mattered. The life of a woman whose actions resonated far beyond just her little family. I saw the truth in Scripture where God says those who mourn will be comforted as people who I hadn't seen in a while or, or, or people who I didn't even know would come up to me and offer me support, condolence, a shoulder to cry on. Same for my brother's accident. Seeing people that I hadn't seen in 20 years come and, and drop everything to, to spend time with people who were grieving, to spend time with people who were wrestling with uncertainty. I saw God in those moments, and I began to, to put the pieces together. I began to understand that when God calls us to rejoice, he's not asking us to rejoice at what is happening, not, not rejoice at the evidence of what our lives show us, but rejoice at the evidence of what is revealed as he meets us in those moments. Right? All throughout Scripture, he, he, he continuously calls to Israel. He continuously calls to his people when things are going wrong, when things are struggling, when, when things seem hopeless. And he says, remember what I have done for you. It's, 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 it's hard if you look at the moment right now to see hope and joy. It's hard to rejoice if your world is falling apart. But if you look back at every instance where that's happened in the past, you will see my love reach out and surround you, protect you, uplift you. And you might not rejoice in the moment. I don't think God is calling us necessarily to always do that. But you can rejoice in knowing that you will not be going through that moment alone. You can rejoice in knowing that I will bring you through it and I will do it in such a way that it will transform you if you let me. You, you can't rejoice in your surroundings. You can't rejoice in the evidence of your own work in life. But you can rejoice in what Jesus has done, is doing, will do Right? We can rejoice if we change our perspective. And that was the first thing that really hit me. It's, it's, it's a matter of perspective. I can't rejoice if I'm focused on myself. But if I focus on Christ, I focus on the evidence of what his love has done, what it's currently doing, what he's promised in his word, 
that perspective shifts, the spotlight comes off of me and is placed squarely on him. And then, no matter the circumstance, rejoicing becomes easy because it's not about me anymore. It's about my creator. It's about my savior. It's about the evidence of what his love is capable of. So, always rejoice might seem difficult on the surface, but if we change our perspective and shift it to Christ, it becomes easy to see in that first step why God would say, this is my will for you. Because my will doesn't reside in what we're doing. My will resides in what my son is doing in you. The second thing that is listed here in Scripture, it says to pray without ceasing. I dug a little bit into the Greek for clarification because it's not easy. And um, the meaning, the literal meaning of the Greek words here is incessantly pray or continuously pray, right? And, and the first picture that popped into mind when, when I heard that was uh, Monty Python, which is probably not your normal instinctual reaction when you hear pray without ceasing, Monty Python. But it made me think of uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, one of my favorite movies. Uh, anytime something good would happen, King Arthur would drop to one knee and begin praying to God, even if it was something small and simple. And, 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 and it made me laugh because it just, when I hear continually pray, the, the, that idea seems so absurd if it's in that context, right? To like, at every moment, just drop to one knee, whatever you're in the middle of. It seems kind of inconvenient, right? You're going about your day, and something goes great. You might take a moment or two, but it's not always the best idea to completely ignore everything around you just to make sure that you're in prayer. I think one ep uh, episode specifically with a, a friend of mine, uh, we, were, we were headed to Miami. And we started to get on the highway. We realized we hadn't prayed for God's protection on the trip. So he's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. And he says, dude, do me a favor. Pray so, you know, we can have a safe journey. I said, cool. And I, I start praying. And halfway through the prayer, I feel the car kind of jerk and, and reorient itself. We finish. I opened my eyes and I just kind of looked at him. I was like, did you, did you close your eyes <laughs> while we were praying? And he's like, have it, man. It's a force of habit. I, I think God is okay with you keeping the eyes open, considering you got the wheel in your hands, dude. Like, he'll understand. So on the surface, again, that idea, it seems kind of absurd, of like continuously praying. But, but I thought about it a little bit more. I dug a little bit more. What does it look like to continuously pray? And I thought about what prayer is, right? It's connection. Connection to the source of life. Connection to Christ himself, to God himself. And I, I thought, well, what's, what better example do we have than Jesus? What, what examples do we have of Christ in Scripture and what his prayer life looked like? And as I dug and I looked, I saw one overarching theme, and that is he did not try to find time to pray. He made time to pray. It was necessary. That constant connection with his Father sustained him often in the most difficult of times. But even when things were going good, right, things can be going well, and if we're not connected, it, it, it can take a lot out of us. I, I, I think of the times where he would feed 5,000 people, where he would minister and heal countless children, men, women. And his first reaction when he was finished serving these people was to retreat and spend time alone with his father. Not even the disciples often would come with him. He would, he would seclude himself in his father's presence. He would make a point to seek out connection. And, and that spoke to me because that is not something that comes easy in general, but in today's world, that's almost an impossibility from an instinctual standpoint. I don't know about you guys, but when I, when I, when I pray, it's in, in moments of downtime, it's, it's very hard for me to seek out and carve out time to just spend in prayer because I often feel unproductive. I feel like there's something I could be doing, something more, right? Like I, I, I can get something quick in and, and, and I'll, I'll check in with God at, at quiet points during my day, but to sit 
and commune with God and, and, and to carve out time to connect with him is something that does not come easily to me. Which might explain why I was struggling with this idea of what God's will is in my life. Because it says it, it's, it's simple. I think we, we, we overcomplicate it, but it's simple. If we take the time, if we make the time to connect with Christ, then we see a tangible result, right? Peace of mind. It says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 that if we make our requests known to God with prayer and thanksgiving, then the peace of God that passes all understandings will guard our hearts and our minds. The unsettled nature of not quite knowing where God wants me to go, the, the, the anxiety that creeps in because the cares of the world overwhelm and, and crowd out my connection with God. It's easy to see why it can be such a struggle. Because the, the, the background noise, the white noise, has become this cacophony of sound that makes it almost impossible to tell the difference between what God is asking of me or telling me and my own inner monologue and what I want. And that struggle between self and selflessness. And, 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 and Scripture's clear that that goes away if we seek connection, if we maintain connection, if we are constantly linked with the author of wisdom. Not to say it'll always be clear on the first pass, but knowing that we can have peace of mind. Knowing that we're not in it alone. That he is walking with us, guiding with us, that he is there letting us know exactly what he expects or what he wants. Sometimes shouting and making it abundantly clear, but sometimes the scripture says whispering. And we're only going to hear the whispers if we take the, the time, if we devote the energy to remain connected. It's not enough to be connected once and hope that it lasts, but to remain connected, to have that peace that comes with constant communion with Jesus is the second step in knowing what God's will is for your life. The third, it kind of echoes the first, uh, to give thanks in all circumstances. Again, when things are going good, this is an easy proposition, right? When your fortunes are positive, when the bank account is in the black and not the red, it's easy to say, thank you, Lord, for what I have. When your friends surround you and you can share a laugh and enjoy the ball game and the test came back with an A, it's easy to say, thank you, Lord. I can see the, the hard work paying off. But when you've been giving everything you have and you're seeing red in the ledger instead of black, if you're seeing the marks down the test page, uh, showing you a, a, a ratio that doesn't really work for your GPA, when you're seeing people that you thought were your friend that you've invested time and energy and money and love into, pay lip service to the idea of being there for you, but then when things get hard, turn and walk away. It's very difficult to remain thankful. And from personal experience, I, I, I've really only found one thing that works in those moments. Because again, it's, it's not about the circumstances that you're surrounded with. That's not what God is saying, be thankful for. But he's saying, what am I doing in your life? And for me, in those moments, God has brought me time and again to his promises. His, the promises of God are the only things that I can truly be thankful for when my life is falling apart. I can, I can, again, I can think of specific instances. I can, and, and, and the promises that are called to my mind or that God has allowed me to find as I dig through scripture. I, the first one that pops in my head, Jeremiah 29, 11. I love that one so much. I carry it with me wherever I go. Um, but the, to know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Right? Or, or, or Romans, uh, Romans 10, verse 9, where it says, all we have to do is, you know, Confess with our mouths that he is 
God, that Jesus is God, to believe that he is risen from the dead and we are saved. When I'm struggling with the idea of am I good enough and, 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 and knowing exactly what sins stain my ledger, that promise is something that continuously I return to and sustains me, reminding me that it's not about what I've done, it's about what he's done. Right? John 14, 3, the, the promise that Jesus gives his disciples right before his crucifixion that, yes, I'm leaving you, but I, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I promise you that I will return and be with you for eternity. These, these promises matter when you look at how chaotic and painful life can be, when you're, when you're searching and sifting through that uncertainty to see God's will in your life. We can return to these promises and know that we can claim them with certainty that they'll be fulfilled. It can still be a struggle because God does not promise that each, each of these will be fulfilled in our lifetime. We might see portions of it. We might see the fullness of it, and that's awesome, but we're not guaranteed necessarily what we expect when we look at these promises. And the, 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 the first instinct, when I, when, I, when I look at my life and say, but Lord, you, you promised not to harm me. You promised me hope, and I don't see it. Things look dark right now. I'm struggling with depression. I'm struggling with finances. I'm struggling with loss. Where's the hope in that? It's, it's, it's hard if we're focusing again on the circumstances around us. But he says, just because it doesn't seem that way now doesn't negate my promise in any way. I still am with you. I'm still walking right beside you, carrying you where need be. I'm still here to provide whatever you need and to minister to your pain. So my promise to heal your broken heart, if it's not there yet, doesn't mean that, that I've given up on you. It means that it's still in progress. But you can trust that just like every promise in Scripture that has come from the mouth of God has been fulfilled, that that one will be fulfilled too. We might not see his presence when we look at the world around us at first pass, but then when we, when we see people willing to sit with us in our darkest hour, when we see people willing to give of their finances, even when they might not have much, when we see people willing to sacrifice to ensure that their children can have a better life, when we see love that doesn't come naturally transform lives that don't deserve it, we see these promises being fulfilled. We know that it's God and not us. We know it's his work in us coming true. We know it's his will guiding us and leading us. It might cost something to see the promises fulfilled. It might, it might be painful. It might be difficult. But it'll always be worth it to place our trust in a God who defies convention. A God who says, no matter what you've done, no matter how dirty, no matter how wretched you think you are, that's not what I see when I look at you. I see my child. I see my creation. I see an opportunity for my love to transform you, to rebuild you, to renew you. And he promises that if we embrace the opportunity, if, if we let him, if we choose to connect our lives to him continually, if we choose to rejoice in this love that has not given up on us, not turned its back on us, not forsaken us, that yes, it might be costly, yes, it might be painful, but it'll be worth it. So I say all that to say this. As we seek God's will in our life, it is, I don't think, a, a one-time thing. I don't think it's a situation where we can always go to him and it'll be clear from the first moment exactly what he's asking. There are those times and when it will be there. Don't be discouraged if that's the case. Because he's given us these three tenets that if we apply them, if we embrace them, 
if we abide by them, will lead us in tune with his spirit. And I think we'll begin to realize that it's not in the moment that we need to seek God's will, but it's this continuous process. It's this everlasting moment, if you will, where his will is not about these fixed points in time. It's about consciously connecting, staying continuously and abiding with him in his love and embracing whatever comes our way with the knowledge that even if it's not in the moment what we think is best for us, we can trust that the God who before creation ever existed saw us in this time struggling, succeeding, whatever it is, he saw us and he whispered our name. He called down through history and said, I have created you to be with me right now in this moment. And if you'll let me, I will celebrate with you the good times. I will be there with you through the bad. I will, I will sustain you when it seems like you can't go on. I'll reveal my will to your life, but it won't just be this one-time message. It won't be a voicemail. It'll be a journey. And I'm willing to take every step with you if you'll let me. But it can't begin until we decide that we want it. It can't begin until we realize that these things that he offers are worth it. So I just want to encourage you guys today, if you're seeking God's will, if it seems like he's not answering with you, if he seems if he seems muddled or far away, run to scripture. You're not alone. The world may be dangerous, but you're not going alone. Run to scripture and, and, and seek him out. Call him on his promises. Stay connected through constant prayer. Rejoice and give thanks at the opportunity we have to rely on God, to let him prove he is who he says he is, to let his love be real in our lives and not just a myth or an idea or a discussion, but see his will fill us, guide us, and every step of the way, draw us closer to him so that when he does come, and make no mistake, he's coming soon, he will look us in the face, whisper our name, and say, I knew it, you've made it. Let's go home. Bow your heads as we end. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a God that we can trust. We have a God that is willing to reveal his will to us. That we have a God who we can give thanks, that we can rejoice with, that we can stay connected to through the ups and the downs of life in a way that matters, in a way that makes life worth it. You know what each heart in this place is struggling with. You know what each is wrestling with. You know what, what needs are here what desires are here, what uncertainties, what fears are here. And I pray that you minister to each and every one of them in a way that is unavoidable, that it's you, that your love makes the difference in each situation, that it provides wisdom, that it provides healing, that it provides reconciliation, but most of all, that it provides hope and peace, knowing that we can trust the God of creation to let us know exactly what his will is. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.